Good morning. We're glad that you joined us for worship today. Believe it or not, this is our sixth week of worshiping together using virtual technology. In these unsettling, if not challenging times, I trust that you can sense God's presence and his care for you. We continue to hold on to the promise that we celebrated last week, the promise of the new life that we can enjoy through the resurrection of Jesus. As a church, we want to do whatever we can to provide support for you and to remind you that being part of a community like Fremont enables all of us to persevere through these extraordinary circumstances. Our website, our weekly updates, our daily devotionals are just a few of the ways that you can stay connected beyond these worship services. And when all this is over, I trust that we will all be able to share of all the wonderful things that God has done in our midst. Hear these words of encouragement from Psalm 40. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance from my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love or your faithfulness from the great congregation. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. Thank you for being with us this morning. I recently read a book in which the author said that if we're going to be a biblical people, that is a people whose lives and whose actions are shaped to the pattern of scripture, that we will be a people who remember. We'll remember God's character and God's heart. We'll remember the great things that God has done. 
we'll remember what God has done in each of our individual lives. How God has surprised us with good, how God has forgiven us, how God has loved us and corrected us, and how God has led us. We're going to take a moment now and begin to pray, but we're going to start in silence, in a time of contemplation. And during that time, I would encourage you to remember. Remember the things that God has done within your life. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we do bring to mind all of the ways in which you have touched us, all of the ways in which you have, by your Holy Spirit, led us and encouraged us, those ways in which you have sometimes assured us of your closeness, of your compassion, and of your care. And so we would ask today that as we begin this time of worship, that once again, this would be an occasion for us to recall and to bring to mind all of those ways in which you have been active within our lives. And as we do that, may we truly be a people who are thankful for all of the ways in which Jesus has come to us and all of those ways in which he leads and guides our individual lives. We pray then that we would reflect his goodness in this world and as your people. And we pray for that in his name, who with you and with the Holy Spirit reigns and lives forever. Amen. Good morning. You know, before we began sheltering in place as a community and stopped gathering as a church, we were doing a series on the Gospel of Mark, one of the four accounts of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And I thought it would be appropriate for us to return there today. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to this remarkable story that we find in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. What I'm going to do here this morning is a little different than what I have been doing. I'm going to read a little and talk a little and teach a little and then go back and finish the story. And before I jump into reading the opening verses of this account in Mark 5, I want to ask you a question and ask you to hold on to that question. And this is the question. If someone were to come and ask you, what has the Lord done for you? What has the Lord done for you? What would you say? Today we're going to learn about someone who was able to tell their story and in many ways it changed a whole city and group of cities. Mark chapter 5 begins like this. Jesus and his disciples went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure or unclean spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Now I'm gonna stop there for a moment. Before Easter, we looked at a story in the Gospel of Mark in which Jesus and his companions, his disciples, those that were learning his way of life, crossed over the Sea of Galilee and encountered a raging storm and Jesus was able to calm and still that storm with a word. And so this is the continuation of that story. And what Mark is telling us in three different ways in this opening verse is that Jesus and his disciples have gone into an unclean place. Now, I wanna be honest with you about something. A lot of times I've had a hard time uh, 
identifying with this concept of unclean and clean in the scriptures. In the Old Testament especially, God's people were uh, told that certain animals, certain things were unclean to them, other things were clean to them. And it, I always had a hard time making sense of that. But I think in the time that we are in right now of sheltering place and dealing with a global pandemic, we might have a, a better grasp of these distinctions between clean and unclean. And if you were to add to that religious devotion, you, we would gain a better understanding of really what these distinctive parts of being unclean and clean are. For when God's people were declaring certain things unclean or avoiding certain things as unclean, they were doing so not only for public health, or to avoid a virus, but because they believed that God was commanding them to live like this. And if you dive into some of those dietary laws, you might actually discover that what modern science and health are now telling us, God told his people a long time ago. But what Mark is telling us here is that here is a Jewish rabbi and his disciples going into a place of uncleanliness. A man with an unclean spirit living among the tombs, uh, death and decay and graves were not to be touched and not to be certainly a place that you would go and visit. Uh, but also this region, the Gerasenes, uh, this is a region of the Decapolis, it means 10 cities. And this was a region that uh, for Jewish people in the first century, if you were observing that way of life, that you would have not ventured here. For the Decapolis was a place that was mostly a place of worshiping gods like Zeus, the Greek god. Uh, pigs, which were declared unclean, were sacrificed on the altar to Zeus. And so this whole region was a place that would, would have been considered unclean. And Mark is telling us that here comes Jesus into that place. Let's go on and read more of the story. It says that this man, this demon-possessed man, lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained, hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Now, this is a picture of a man tormented by demonic spirits. And some of us might have a hard time with our modern sensibilities uh, making sense of that. I was reading and listening to a sermon by Tim Keller. He wrote a book called The King's Cross that talks about the Gospel of Mark. And in that, he talks about this argument. If any of us are having a hard time with this idea of, of uh, personal evil, Keller makes this point. He says, if we believe in a personal God that is powerful, is it so hard for us to also believe in a personal force of evil that seeks to destroy us and also does have power, though not the power of God, as we will soon discover. It's not hard for us to really grasp the sense that, yes, there is evil and it's personal. And let's just take that a step further for a moment. Look at what the evil has done to this man. On the one hand, how many of us have experienced uh, a temptation or even something evil that at first gives us a sense of power and even strength. Just like this man, he had become so powerful that even chains could not hold him. No one was able to subdue him, Mark says. But look at what also evil has done to this man. Day and night he cries out and is in wanting to relieve himself from the pain that he's cutting himself with stones. That, friends, is what the Bible teaches us about evil, is that on the one hand it might look good and it might promise power, but in the end it seeks only to destroy and cause pain. 
This evil has pushed this man to the margins of society, and there he cries out for relief. Mark paints a a dramatic, vivid picture of what evil has done and, and how this man has been left alone. And when he says no one is able to subdue him, we wonder if there's any help for a man like this. But watch this. Verse 6 picks up the story and it says, When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure, unclean spirit. Two things briefly about this. When this strong and tortured man sees Jesus, he runs to him, falls on his knees. Even evil, in the presence of God, in the presence of good power, knows that it does not have power over Jesus. The second thing is, there's a part of me that wants to believe that something within the man saw Jesus and wanted to hope for healing. Why do I think that? Because instead of running away from something more powerful than itself, this man, though consumed with evil, runs to Jesus. He runs to Jesus for healing and for hope. Remember that running to, because we'll come back to that later in the story. The story continues and it says, Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. Jesus gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Now, I'm sure all of us have questions about this part of the story, and certainly I can't answer all of them today because I want to get to the last profound, beautiful part of this story. But one important fact that we can readily see here is that this man was afflicted by a legion, thousands of these unclean demonic spirits. A legion uh, represented thousands of Roman soldiers. But we also might be struck here and our modern sensibilities could be offended by this destruction of animal life. But let's note here that it's the demonic spirits that come out of the man, rush into the pigs, and causes them to go down the cliff and be drowned in the sea. And lastly, we have to notice this, that the author of life, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, values the life of one created in His image, so much so that nothing will keep him from healing and rescuing one that's made in the image of God. The story ends like this. Those that were tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Watch this. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, the region of ten cities, how much Jesus had done for him. And the people were amazed. You know, the Gospel of Mark is really trying to tell us two things. One, 
who is this Jesus? In the opening chapters, he tells us that Jesus is the Son of God. And then throughout the gospel, the most unlikely characters are the ones that rightly identify Jesus as the Son of God. And here, a demon-possessed man is the one who tells us the true identity of who Jesus is. But the Gospel of Mark is also a book about discipleship. It's a book about what does it mean to follow this Jesus in his life. And here we see in this story that there are those that will not follow and there are those that want to follow. And the great irony in this gospel is that here is this, uh, this demon-possessed man who shows that he is wanting to follow. He is wanting to pursue the path of discipleship. But the respectable townspeople, the ones that apparently have not been consumed and plagued by demons, they want Jesus to leave. There's a lot of reasons for that. They were probably afraid seeing the great power that Jesus brought in delivering this man from the legion of demons. They probably also were very angry at Jesus that that if they had made their living on raising pigs so that they could be sacrificed on the altar of the god Zeus, they were angry that their livelihood just rushed down the bank and into the sea. But there, here is this irony that there are people that will not follow and ask Jesus to leave, and yet it's the man that was left alone, living among the tombs, an unclean place, plagued by demons, that wants to go and follow Jesus. What about you? Going back to that question that I asked at the very beginning, if someone were to ask you, what has the Lord done for you? What would you say? What would you say? You know, I think a lot of times, many of us believe that that we might not be used by God to uh, bring other people to a knowledge of Him. We don't know enough. We don't study enough. uh, And so how could God possibly use us? But note what happens here to this man. We would think, on the one hand, that that perhaps Jesus could have let, let him into the boat and follow along with the disciples. Maybe he could have learned more, seen more, been taught more by Jesus. And then he would have had more story to tell. But here Jesus sends him as an ambassador of the gospel, as a, as a messenger of good news. This man has one encounter with Jesus, and it's a remarkable one. And Jesus sends him into a region of ten cities, and he proclaims that this Jesus, the Son of God, is able to deliver even him from evil. So what's your story? What's your story? How how has God delivered you? Whenever you read a passage like this, I wonder where you place yourself in a story like this. If you put yourself as an outside observer, consider this instead. Perhaps you could put yourself in the place of this man. Perhaps every single one of us could remember a time in which we felt isolated and alone. And perhaps we cried out day and night just like he did. Perhaps we were in a place of death and decay and destruction. Perhaps we were in a place in which we were hurting ourselves and hurting others. And then Jesus came. That's really all of our stories, isn't it? That Jesus came and rescued us and delivered us from a place where We once were in darkness, and He brought us into light. We once were in pain, and He brought healing. As we wrap up this story, I want to have you notice one last thing. There's a group of people in the story that ask Jesus to to leave, and then there's one that really asked if He could stay. Don't be the people 
that ask Jesus to leave. Don't ask Jesus to leave. Ask Jesus to stay. Ask that you could stay with Jesus. I'm reminded that in the the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus utters these words, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would hear my voice and open up the door to me, I will come in and eat with them and them with me. Jesus is inviting us to stay with him, to follow him and be with him. And perhaps that's an invitation for you today. Perhaps it's an invitation that you've accepted in the past, but there's something about this story that rings anew. Perhaps this is a first time for you being invited into the presence of Jesus. And in a time like this, perhaps what is beautiful about us being in our homes in worship is that if I were to offer an invitation to you and invite you to stand up, invite you to raise your hand or even come forward in a church service, how many of us might not do that because of the fear of what others might think around us? But in a moment, I'm going to close us in a word of prayer, and I want to invite you. Don't leave Jesus. Don't ask Jesus to leave on this day, but invite him to stay. Invite invite him to be your Lord. Invite him to be the one that you will follow. And so as I close in prayer, perhaps stand up. Perhaps raise your hand. And perhaps within your heart, repeat this prayer with me or a prayer of your own. Would you pray with me knowing that this is the Son of God who has defeated death, evil, and the grave and has set us all free just like this man in the Decapolis. And as Jesus went across the sea just for this one man, He will cross a sea for you as well. Let us pray together. Our gracious God, we thank you that you invite us. You stand at the door and knock and we hear your voice. Would we open the door of our heart Open the door of our life and let you in and find that you have set a table before us. And that great act of hospitality, eating a meal that you will eat with us and share with us all of your glorious gifts of life and life everlasting. For all those that may be standing or raising their hand or in their heart and mind praying for the first time to you, we know and love the fact that you are the God who hears our prayers. You know the decisions that are being made right now. Seal them, Lord, in your promises and by your grace. For we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Throughout everything that we are encountering right now, I imagine as we look back a year or five years from now, we're going to have a lot of stories to tell. Some will be sad stories, 
Uh, some of the stories we'll laugh at, um, and some of the stories will inspire hope. I know one of the things that's been encouraging for me, and I know others throughout this process, is when we hear stories about how the Lord is working even in the midst of this. And I think something very powerful is when we come together as a church, um, we still believe that as a church, God is calling us um, to, to be followers of Jesus um, in our neighborhood, in our city, and in our world. And when we have an opportunity to, to give back and to be generous, we have an opportunity um, to not only share with others um, a story of how the Lord has worked in our lives, but when we give to one of our local mission partners, for instance, like those and Fishes, what we're doing is we are helping um, them realize how powerfully God is answering their prayers and how he is working in their lives. And so when we give generously, we have an opportunity not only to tell a story about how the Lord has worked in our lives, but we are helping to be used by God to produce a story within others of his generosity to them. All right, let's go ahead and pray together. Father, we pray that you would take these gifts that you have given us and we pray that you would use them to produce a story of how you have worked in people's lives, in our city, our neighborhood, and our world. I pray for those in our midst. God, I pray that you would bring a sense of, of comfort, um, a sense of strength. I pray that you would produce a tangible reminder within us of how close you are, of how near you are, um, and of your love for us. May you bring to remembrance the various stories that you have given each of us of your faithfulness. And Father, we lift all these things up to you in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who crossed the sea for one man trapped under the weight of sin and evil, the one who would cross the sea for you, may the grace of that Lord Jesus be with you. May the love of God the Father who sent the Son so that we might have life in His name, may that love be with you now and always. And may the fellowship, the community of His Spirit, His Spirit which is with us and within us, may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of His Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.